a spotlight on the arts. Hi, I'm Iris Acker, your host for today's segment, which is on opera. Oh, one of my favorite segments. Let's meet our celebrity panel. Up first is Michael McKeever, who is an actor and a playwright. Karen Stevens, who is an actress and a, a writer. Bill Hirschman, who's a critic. It's the way that I say that. You're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today is Justin Moss. Justin is the director of Broward Operations and Outreach. What a title, Justin. It's, it's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. What do you really do? Well, I've been asking myself that for more years <laughs> than I'm willing to confess to all of you. I have, over the course of my 20 years at Florida Grand Opera, done many, many different jobs. Currently, though, I manage the opera's operations in Broward County and uh, also the outreach programs, getting out into the community, trying to get people enthusiastic about what we're doing, uh -huh. get them a little bit knowledgeable so at least they will want to see more and hear more. And uh, as much of that as we do, it's never enough. How has opera changed through the years? Mm, how's opera has it? changed? Maybe. Well, it all, probably one of the most dramatic changes in the art form over the years is how expensive it's become. Oh. Um, I believe it was George Bernard Shaw who once said the most costly undertakings man has ever devised are warfare and the production of grand opera. <laughs> <laughs> I think that That's he was true. absolutely it's correct. It's difficult to imagine anything uh, coming close to the cost. What's your annual budget? Our annual budget's about $10 million oh. now. Wow. Um, and that's doing four productions a year. Um, it's, it's really staggering. It's so complex with your scenery, your costuming. Uh, many operas have scores of, of principal artists. You've got a full orchestra, and uh, orchestras have to be paid for rehearsal as well as performances, too. Theater rental costs lighting equipment, um, transporting all of these people in and out of town when you get ready to uh, begin a rehearsal period. It's pretty staggering. It's in fact a surprise that as many of us around the country as are still in business remain so. Um, the challenges are just greater every year. And with the economy having been on the ropes since 2008, we've seen a lot of companies go down. Yes. We've lost some really Big companies. Great companies uh. who were doing and had a history of doing first-rate work. And their loss has been staggering to those communities where they uh, operated and really to the whole cultural landscape of the country at the same time. Um, some of us think maybe things in our lifetimes will never get back to the kind of economic optimism and health that we once enjoyed and knew. Um, I think there's such a, uh, a high level of caution mm. that trying to come up with and secure the funding you need so far in advance in order to produce grand opera, we should be planning four years in advance. Well, How do you it, secure that funding? There you go. That <laughs> well, that's exactly it. Uh, as you go out trying to get those resources identified, people look forward to maybe three seasons ahead and think, is my business still going to be making money? in three years. Will we still be profitable uh, as we go out trying to renew subscriptions? For example, at the worst of the economic crises, we're sending renewal notices to our subscribers who are so uncertain about their mm. future, mm. thinking, do I really want to be both unemployed and a subscriber to the opera <laughs> <laughs> at the same time <laughs> and a year from now? You know, And they, they waited. and, and, and and we're just very, very cautious in terms of proceeding. Ideally, what we like to do is secure underwriting gifts that are going to ensure that a certain percentage of the base costs of a production will be covered. And, and that's either you know a promise from a foundation, from a corporation. Uh, really, though, throughout the whole country, it's individuals who, who make the key difference in we terms of providing serious funding. You were speaking about outreach programs to, to uh, bring in new audience or maybe reintroduce uh, the opera to um, audiences who will have perhaps left. What are those outreach programs? Well, I think one of the most successful programs that we've done for more than 30 years now is uh, a partnership that we began 
more than 30 years ago with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, uh, then just Dade County Public Schools, <laughs> and we mounted a small, short, staged production that served as a great introduction to the art form, and we took it into every high school in the county. Which meant, if you graduated from one of the high schools in Miami-Dade County, you had been exposed to opera. Now we know when we assemble 300 kids in a school and we perform a short opera with real living and exciting and attractive mm -hmm. singers, and what, we're not going to make opera fans out of every <laughs> one of those 300 kids. <laughs> but there will be some in every assembly whose lives will be changed forever, who will connect with the art form and think, this is what I've been missing all my life. And that's the shame to miss that opportunity with those kids. So if you do it long enough in every high school, every year for 30 years, you have an audience. And today, when we have people from around the country come, especially to our performances in uh, Miami-Dade County at the Adrian R. Center, people always comment on the audience that comes in. They go, geez, this doesn't look like any other opera audience in the country. This looks like the community, the demographics of your mm -hmm. audience, reflect the demographics of the community, and it's filled with young people in their 20s and their 30s. We never see this. I know. The opera audience is generally perceived as elderly, but here young people now working, getting a little bit stable, were introduced to the art form. They came to dress rehearsals. We have many, many high school students attend our final dress rehearsals. They understand how to behave, what's going to happen, all the mystery and the barriers are removed and so they're comfortable. Those who really connected with the art form are now comfortable to be buying tickets and, and, and take a place in our audience. So they're more diverse now? The audiences are more diverse? I think in, in that the they really are. When I first arrived here 20 years ago, I was sort of told um, that the profile of the audience was largely elderly, mm -hmm. et cetera. And uh, I looked it over and thought that's largely true. And I have seen over 20 years a dramatic change as these kids have grown up who were introduced in schools with the outreach program and now are coming and, and, and but it's, also, it's but encouraging. But also ethnically, if you go particularly to opening night at the Arsht, you see a heavy Hispanic yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, representation. You see African-American representation yeah. and it's not your traditional audience, but that makes me wonder. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm very curious about is, as a relative newcomer to opera, is how you overcome that public perception that it's an elitist art form, that it's not accessible, that it doesn't speak to me. How do you how do you fight that? It's hard to fight because people are um, brought up with such a host of mm -hmm. strong stereotypes. The lady, the overnourished lady <laughs> <laughs> in the helmet with the horns and, and all of this. And it's tough to get people to shake loose. Well, isn't that what opera is? Those, I'm <laughs> exactly. Not, Michael those, is perfect. Those, He's not an opera goer. He's never been. I, I think I might like it, but I have to tell you, it intimidates me. Well, you know, there are many things in life that cannot be fixed. This is one that can. <laughs> and I think it would be Good. encouraging to see you uh, Try it and make the difference. One thing we've been successful with a couple of times is getting sponsors. One year it was American Express. Uh, mm -hmm. Twice it's been the Knight Foundation locally who have funded a whole performance of an opera for us, usually a popular work like Madama Butterfly by Puccini. And we have given away every ticket in wow. that audience. Wow. And we would have a big campaign in mm -hmm. the press and on the radio stations and on television. And you could get online and enter the drawing for a pair of these tickets and we'd give the whole house away and then provide people with you know some information that would help them know a little bit more when they came encourage them to come to the pre opera lecture that I do and uh, we were getting you know nearly 2,000 people in the opera house most of them for the very first time coming because it was free Mm -hmm. And it's the hook like, you know, the neighborhood mm -hmm. drug dealer. The first <laughs> <laughs> and then we think you'll want to come back and be happy to pay. I, I should make a plug that I, when I go, again, for the last two, three, four years, your pre-opera your, your pre show, or <laughs> your, show, your discussion goes 
light years to making what I'm going to see accessible and understandable and putting it in context. Is I always it part of the program that that's It's often. an hour beforehand, right? Oh, it's always wonderful. one hour before the curtain, and I do a, a half hour overview of the context of the piece, what to listen for, what's going on. So to give you, people dramatically. markers. Thank you, Bill. I, mean, I but, appreciate but so you saying so. The most important thing is that you don't have to know the opera. You right. don't need to know the plot. You don't have to feel like, oh my God, I'm going into something I know nothing about. It really makes a huge difference in understanding what you're going to go see. It certainly has helped me. What about captioning? When did captioning start? That, that began about 35 years ago. It began in the uh, Canadian Opera Company in Toronto as sort of a dare. Latfi Mansouri talked to his staff. He was then running the company um, and just died, sadly, you know, not long ago after retiring from San Francisco Opera. He was talking to his staff about the possibility of projecting summarizes, uh, summaries of, of what the singers were singing as they sang during a performance. And some of his staff thought it was an interesting idea. Some thought he was a lunatic to even <laughs> propose it. And so almost on a dare, they said, well, let's try it and, and see what happens. And um, it was hugely controversial. James Levine is frequently quoted as having said, over my dead body in the <laughs> opera, will we ever have projected or, mm. or translations of any kind. Well, if you've been to the Metropolitan Opera, you know there's on the back of every seat a little screen <laughs> yes. that shows you a, a summarized translation of the words as they're sung. This is the difference it made. When I was interested in opera in the early 1970s, trying to learn as much as I could, I had to buy recordings. Some of the epic, long Verdi operas and certainly the Wagner operas were four hours and more of music, and I would lie there with those LPs and the libretto trying to hear <laughs> the German text as it was sung and the English translation, and I would spend hours going through, you know, five times this four-hour opera. I would get in the opera house, the curtain would go up, the music would begin, the opera would be about 10 minutes into the show, and I was lost. <laughs> Hopelessly. <laughs> and then I think, well, I'm going to have to do this again, you know, at some point, and I would. But today, because of those projected translations, you can walk in off the street, never having seen an opera before in your life, having no clue about what the show is about or what is going to take place, and stay right with every minute, fully engaged for a full three-hour opera performance. Right. This so changed the landscape for bringing people to of the course. art form. Uh, as you all know, the world has so changed and people have so little time today, I don't think anyone alive has time to listen to a four-hour opera <laughs> in preparation of, of, right. of going to a performance. Right. Uh, and I don't know how I came up with the time. Maybe that's why I'm so um, narrow, narrowly focused <laughs> sure at all today, giving up all of that time. But today it's made a huge difference and people say they've never enjoyed the people who've gone to the opera all their lives never have enjoyed it as much as since they began seeing it with projected translations. I always wonder about those sitting up front. Why are they sitting up there? You can't see the captioning. That's right. I mean, to me, like the tenth row is perfect. The last row right. is one. And really. we, because of our audience here in South Florida, we do both an English and, and Spanish spa oh, yes. summary projected. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, you can't translate every word that's being sung. It would be like an Evelyn Wood. Class. <laughs> <laughs> but you try to really thoughtfully summarize it is, what's being is, done. Is this uh, just uh, a Western phenomenon, or is this done around the world? It's done all over the world. I saw a, a production of uh, Rusalka, the Vorjak's opera Rusalka, at the Bastille in Paris once, and the opera was sung in Czech, which is very close to Russian, and there were projected translations in French. And so between listening to the song text <laughs> and reading the French translations, I was very busy during the, uh, yeah. that whole that performance. Nice. When you guys did the magic flute, though, your <gasps> translation a, a, a couple of seasons ago, your translations were in very, very much vernacular. Mm -hmm. And there were even jokes that I don't think Mozart knew about when he was writing. <laughs> when yes, they I'm, referred to the, the, the uh, singer who actually referred to yes, the caption. Yes, that's right. That came out so and had to point to yeah, one of the point scenes. Out the caption. <laughs> Here's your clue as to what's going on. <laughs> now, that and would have been the perfect first opera for you. There you yes. go. Well, I missed that one. funny. Yeah, it really was funny. And The Magic Flute is an opera that people have seen a lot, and some people resist, can I really sit through this again? 
and people loved that that production. It was so it was. engaging. But you dared really to do it good. differently. You did. Yeah, we did. And, and and there's so many opportunities with opera, so many takes on your concept of the piece, on how you will stage it, that with really inventive and creative directors and designers, you can revisit a piece you've seen 30 times and Why come away yeah. almost feeling you've had a completely and entirely new experience. Speaking of the magic flute, I played violin uh, mm -hmm. until I was a senior in high school. Um, and I went to a music clinic at the University of Florida when I was 13. And that was the first time uh, that I was um, exposed to opera uh, on the program one night mm -hmm. was um, a woman who was singing opera. And me and my 13-year-old friend got a fit of the giggles. <laughs> we, we, we had just never heard anything heard like that singing. before. Yeah, it was just, it just struck us so funny. But now I love the opera. Who, who knew? Mm -hmm. Who knew that 13-year-old girl would have grown up to like the opera so yeah. much. And yeah. um, but so I just wanted to say that and I, I, I just wanted to know if there was a way that um, we could get more thirteen year old girls like me, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, to to go to the opera, to well, to we sing do, opera. We do and make have it affordable. <laughs> and, yeah. Because yeah. Karen was saying she can't afford to go to the yeah. opera. We have, you know, these programs where we bring a thousand kids to the final dress rehearsals from high schools. Singing opera when you're 13 years old is usually not a good idea. <laughs> One of the reasons opera is so thrilling and so exciting is that we don't use amplification in opera. Right. Right. And someone has to learn to project enough sound to stand on a stage with an orchestra with 70 instruments playing at full volume between them and the audience and to be able to cut through that curtain of sound and nail someone in their seat so that they're having a physical experience listening to that singing. It's big stuff and it's physical and it's thrilling and that's one of the reasons it's so exciting. It's not good for 13 year olds to do that. <laughs> but what about so affordable, we encourage, Justin, affordable, We affordable. encourage people to wait to start right. singing or studying opera seriously until their late teens, really. Mm -hmm. Affordable. We have tickets as low as $10 wow. per performance. There you go, Karen. You, I've, Think of several movies I wouldn't be able to see. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. One of the th there, I'm curious about whether there, the expectations of someone like Michael comes to see your show. Be interesting. To well, track I mean, that. the expectations <laughs> of an audience that thinks of what they're coming to see. For instance, uh, there was just an interview with Stephen Sondheim the other day, mm -hmm. and he was saying that the difference between musical comedy theater and opera is that musical comedy theater is more concerned with narrative than anything else. Whereas in his estimation, opera is more about the experience and appreciating what you're seeing on stage from an oral standpoint as opposed to a storytelling standpoint. The physical production is of that, the music. Do you think yeah. he's on target there? I think in large measure he is. I mean, Really, you can't categorize an artistic experience quite so easily. Mm -hmm. I think William Butler Yeats' famous line, how can you know the dancer from the dance? Mm -hmm. Neither exists apart from the yeah, other. No. Um, but in opera, yeah, much of it is about the very production of the sound, and that's the show. As opposed to what's going to happen to Chocho Sam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the show, you know, how, right. how will it be done? But they say the same of Pushkin, and you know, the Russian poet, that those tired stories, everybody knows them, and, and what's important is the way he tells them. Mm -hmm. you you know, we know how they all end, but it's the beauty of the telling there you are. that makes us love them and revisit them and continue to go back, and it's the way the story is yeah. told. Well, about master classes, I remember uh, uh, being auditing, <laughs> not that I was part of it, but yes, yeah, some wonderful wonderful out, we've got, um, I'm trying to remember who, who led them, but wonderful experience. It's also a good way to get introduced to opera, I Right, think. And, and, and understand a little bit about what some of the challenges are. We have a young artist studio. Yes. Uh, we audition usually, sometimes we'll have seven, eight hundred applicants. We'll audition mm. a couple of hundred and select eight. And they're with us through the season performing what we call an opera compromario roles in the theater you call them supporting roles. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and they also cover the lead roles. You call it understudy, we call it covering. <laughs> and um, they're prepared to go on if there's a true emergency. 
So it's a huge learning experience and, and, and you know, a wonderful opportunity for these young artists. We do a series of master classes for them, bringing in leading international mm -hmm. artists yes. who come. Uh, and it's quite a drill. The singer, deeply intimidated, stands and sings for this world-renowned artist wow. mm -hmm. and then gets criticized. <laughs> sometimes pulled apart, sometimes supported, you know, very kindly. Uh, and, and all these great, great artists have different methods of working with these young singers. Mm -hmm. But the goal that all of them have is to bolster their level of confidence, their understanding of what they need to do as a performer, and to be encouraged to try to continue working to do better. We're talking about the changes in opera. Today, the actors, their dancers, yeah. you know, it is a, it's a wonderful experience because they've trained and the hiring is so different. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about bringing in these illustrious stars. Mm -hmm. From all over the world, you bring them in. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well in advance, you have to book them because they are so popular. You know, Iris, opera became stale as an art form probably beginning in the 1950s and then coasting into the late 60s, maybe even the early 70s. Um, audiences had come to tolerate artists who were not committed performers, mm. artists who were singers and sometimes awfully good singers, <laughs> but who largely stood and sang and let the drama fend for itself, such as there was. And the experience became one, well, it, it, those low values laid a dead hand over the whole art form, really. The experience people came away with was, was not at all what the potential experience is in attending an opera. That began to change. Uh, I think the leaders of, of the companies around the country took their, their jobs very, very seriously as we went from having just seven, eight, or ten companies in the country to having more than a hundred professional producing opera companies wow. in the country. The big houses and the big population centers found themselves challenged when people would say, you know, I had a much better time seeing the Opera Theater of St. Louis's production <laughs> of X than I did sitting in your house where I paid five times as much, you know. Um, and people began to feel you know, they were being shaken up. The demands were increasing from the audiences. Audiences weren't going to tolerate mm -hmm. that stuff. And I think we saw a real rebirth of the art form. We saw a rebirth of interest. People were now coming away from the opera wanting to go back as opposed to going, oh, please, I hope she never drags me back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people want to go back now because they're having an experience of a really high quality. I try to do homework before I go since my knowledge is uh, evolving. And I found it fascinating. Sometimes I will listen to a recording, sometimes look at a DVD. And I saw a uh, visual recording of, um, I think it was Joan Sutherland in Lucia de Lamour, mm -hmm. and it was done many years ago. And it was fascinating how the staging, that the director basically had the woman standing in front of the man, and they faced straight out, and they went, para. And that, and it was gorgeous singing, obviously, it was Joan mm -hmm. Sutherland. But it didn't make me feel a thing. Mm -hmm. Then I came the following week and saw what the Florida Grand Opera did mm -hmm. with their Lucia de Lamour, and I thought, okay, I'm feeling something. Yeah. Because it was, you're right, they were acting, mm -hmm. but I also saw the director, and as you were talking about, the set designer and the lighting designer mm -hmm. were trying to create production values that might not be multi-billion dollar sets, but they were very much aimed at trying to get a emotional reaction, not just a, wow, she sings really good. <laughs> a total investment in both the musical and the theatrical experience. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's evolved so that it's, you know, Michael, you would love the opera. I got to tell you, I'm hooked. I, I'm going to be going to the opera <laughs> this season, know? I'm telling you right now. We have created an audience today. I'm telling you, Justin, you have created an Amen. audience today, without a doubt. I think for those who've been curious but hesitant. And I think that that $10, it may be up high, but at the Broward Center, 
where I do go to see at the Broward Center Performing Arts, I think it's fine. I really do. I think. It does come on an oxygen bottle. <laughs> <laughs> the one great consolation about the, the, the furthest seats from the stage, they're also the highest, and that is always where the best sound is in any Isn't opera Isn't that amazing? House. With no microphones. Yes, the sound is so amazing. focused and so thrilling up there. I can remember my first days at San Francisco Opera getting to know the opera house and stood, being unable to buy seats, or I would buy a standing room ticket, and Joan Sutherland mm -hmm. down on the stage looking about that tall. <laughs> <laughs> and we both know she's a lot taller than that. <laughs> In several dimensions. And yet the <laughs> sound was thrilling. The sound was just electrifying up there. It really was mm. quite an experience. Really, really something. As I've told you, Justin, I think that all these years that I've been doing these shows, that it's always been to put a spotlight on the arts to promote the arts. I'm so anxious for everybody to go not only to theater and opera and the ballet and whatever exists out there on a stage. I don't enjoy an opera on film. They are exploiting them now in the movie theaters. I need the experience myself of their bodies of being able to see them up there and, and enjoy them accordingly. And it's always not enough time, always not enough time. But I, I will repeat because I really feel very strongly that we have probably created an audience for you among right here. Price, experience, theater, <laughs> and opera. And uh, it's a true love of mine, without a doubt. So what, I uh, encourage everybody. What challenges to go. do you think there still Jim. are? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, unfortunately, I can't oh, ask him time. a question right now okay. because we have just about run out of time. That's fine. But again, Justin, every season outdoes the season before. Thank you, Iris. So we look well, forward. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you <laughs> this year. Those of you who haven't been before, shame on you. But again, this is something that can be fixed. There you and we'll go. Work can on be that. fixed. I like it. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, our pleasure for sure, Justin, every time, every season. And our, my pleasure is alerting everybody uh, how they can find out what's happening on stage, on all the stages in South Florida. If you go to floridatheateronstage.com, it will alert you to what's happening. Uh, that's one strong way of finding out. And another is to continue to watch us because we alert you to everything that's going on in South Florida on a stage as we spotlight the arts. Thank you. I thank you all very much. Justin, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.